High Adventure. This is the last one. About ruddy time. The windows in this place are endless. Well, hello, who's there? Well, it's gone six. Nobody should be here at this time. Well, it's not Mr. Wilson. Hang on, there's somebody else behind him there. What's that he's got in his hand? Crikey, it's, it's a gun. He's going to... I miss you, can't go around doing chicken things. Hey! Oh, hell! <laughs> Terribly sorry, old man. Nothing personal, you understand. I'll keep an eye out for the funeral. Let's dash now. Ta-da! <laughs> In a small, badly lit room above a coffee shop in Soho, the man stared out of the open bay window into the street below. Seven o'clock. And that sleazy corner of London was coming alive. The chattering voices of those in search of a good time and the beckoning calls of those whose business was pleasure. The man was dressed in a dark suit. Under a mop of black hair and bushy eyebrows were those deep-set eyes. Dark wells that absorbed all and revealed nothing. Below them, the misshapen nose and the moustache that concealed the cruel, cynical mouth. A deep scar ran the full length of his pockmarked face, curling up at the disfigured chin. He looked in from the window at the contents of the room. A bed, a chair, a table with a phone. On the floor was a frayed suitcase, the handle of which had held the tags of every major airline in existence. On the bed, open and with its contents spilling out, was a large black attaché case. His eyes focused upon the array of guns strewn across the quilt, his mind weighing up the pros and cons of each. Which shall he use next time, and when? He sat down on the chair, his hands stroking the phone, his muscles flexing in anticipation, waiting. Yes, yeah, come in. Uh, you wanted to see me, sir? Oh, yes, Sinclair. Come in and sit down, would you? Thank you. We've lost Daly. Lost him? Well, don't look so incredulous, man. It does happen, you know. He was found dead in the offices of Wilson and Glover's toy factory by the Grand Union Canal. Well, it's just that... I only saw him this morning. Seems incredible. Mm. He was a good man. Never had a share of good luck, though. What was he working on, sir? Well, officially, he wasn't working on anything. He was off on two weeks' leave today. Oh. When did it happen? Sometime this evening. I've only just heard myself. About seven, a bobby was passing along outside the factory and saw a light on in the offices. The window was broken. He went to investigate and found the body. When he reported the identity of Daly to the yard, the case was naturally referred to us. Is that why you sent for me? You want me to work on it? Uh, no, no. There's nothing much you can do. No, I sent some of our officers out there to clean the place up. We don't want the press to get wind of it. Oh, I understand, sir. And as for you, uh, as I say, I just wanted to let you know. You worked with Daddy on the Cherenkov case. I wanted to keep on your guard. Do you think it could have been him? It was his style. Ah, Cherenkov's a wily so-and-so. It's unnerving. We know he's out there someplace. But we don't know what he looks like, his cover, the, the circles he revolves in. We know nothing. Just his runny name. Hmm. Perhaps Daly had stumbled on something. No, I don't think so, sir. He would have told me. It seems more likely that he was lured to the factory. An offer of information, maybe. Why didn't he let us know beforehand? Pride. Pride? Yes, sir. You took us off the case because we weren't getting anywhere. It's possible that he was trying to prove himself. In his own time? It's a tough world in MI5, sir. Sink or swim. This was the first failure for me, sir. But for Daly, well, it wasn't the first time he'd come up blank on a case. And that affected him badly. Well, I didn't notice. I thought he seemed relieved to be rid of the charge. That was just his way. A brave face. But it was all bottled up inside. He made a mistake? Uh, well, I'd say that was pretty evident, wouldn't you, sir? Hmm. All right, thanks, Sinclair. You've been a help. That should do for now. Uh, haven't you forgotten something, sir? No, I don't think so. Uh, well, if it is 
Chernenkov, uh, which it probably is, then haven't I something to offer? What I'm trying to say, sir, is that I'd appreciate it if you'd put me back on no, the case. No, no, no. I can't risk it. If he got dead, he might go for you. I don't think so, sir. You don't? Admittedly, I don't know much about Cherenkov, but I do know his ways and his methods. And that's more than you could say for anyone else around here. Well, that's all very well. You can't rule out the possibility that Daly disclosed your identity. So you'd be a sitting duck for a character like Cherenkov. With respect, sir, I disagree. Yeah, yes, Daly got reckless, frustrated even. Probably asked the wrong people the wrong questions. But I knew Daly. He'd never betray a colleague. Hmm. So you're willing to put your head on the blocker? Yes. You know my style of working, sir. Cherenkov's a name that sticks in my gullet. But I don't take risks. Not unless they're carefully calculated. I'm trying to restore your 100% record? I'd appreciate the opportunity, sir. Well, I'll uh, think about it. Uh, please put a bit more effort into it than that, sir. <laughs> All right. I'll give it some serious thought. Will that do? I couldn't ask for more, sir. Thank you. The man in the dark suit sat at the table, drumming his fingers impatiently and staring at the phone. On the back of his left hand was another scar where part of a tattoo had been removed. Only the snake remained. Gone were his initials, or rather, the initials of the man he once was, the man who died in the motor car accident 20 years ago. There would have been a woman's name, too. But the only woman who could have ever loved him had been his mother, and she was long since dead. Five past eight. With intense irritation, he glanced back from the watch to the phone. Perhaps it wouldn't be tonight after all. Oh, is that you, love? Yeah. Where the bloody hell have you been? I told Doris I'd meet her at half past seven. It's gone eight now. You know how I like my bingo on a Friday night. Here, what's the matter with you? There's, there's blood on your collar. And your hair's all matted. Look, you haven't been in a fight, have you? You know what I told Will you, you about Will you belt up to... a tick, woman? I've got a decision to make. Have you been down to the boozer? So what if I have? And so would you if you'd just seen a murder committed. Oh, a murder, was it? Oh, that's a new one no, on No, no, I'm being serious, Edith. Oh, look at my arm, there. Oh! The oh. person what done it tried to kill me, too. Luckily, I slipped off the ladder before he could take proper aim. Or you'd have been a widow by now. That arm need seen to. Yeah, my whole right side's the same. That's the bruises and sores. Nothing broke, Mark. All the same, I'll call the doctor. No, I'll be all right. I'll pop into the surgery in the morning if it will put your mind at rest. Well, what did the police have to say? Who was killed, do they know? Hang on, hang on. I haven't told a soul yet. What do you mean? Why not? I wanted to talk to you first. But you must tell the police. Do you realise what that'll mean? Do you realise? Do you realise? Stop babbling. You're making no sense at all. It'll be in all the papers. That I was cleaning factory windows, making money on the side, when I should be sat at home watching the telly. I lose me dole money. Probably go to court. They'll put me in the nick, they will. Oh, I haven't thought of it like that. Yeah, I see what you mean now. But even so, it's your duty to tell the police. That's a dole. Well, I'll just have to cut the bingo down to once a fortnight. As for you, Bill, you can stop boozing for a start and work a bit harder cleaning windows. Try and get some more clients. Go full time. Oh, come off it, love. I'm getting old now. And what about going to court and all that? Tell them you've just started to clean windows. But as for this murder business, you must tell the police. You can't live with that on your conscience. How come it's okay when I don't tell the social I ain't got a job? But when it comes to the police, you go all soft on me. It's not a matter of going soft. Everyone cheats on the dole. It's a dumb thing. But going around murdering people, well, that's a different matter, isn't it? <sighs> yeah, all right, I'll phone them up if that's what you want. Yeah, it is. Oh, I can't wait to see the expression on Doris's face when I tell her my bills help the police catch a murderer. Hello, Mr. Harris. Now, who the hell am I talking to now? Oh, that's of little consequence. Oh, that's ratty marvellous, isn't it? I call up to do my public duty to Queen and Country, and what do I get? The first geezer tells me to stay off of the booze and stop imagining things, says there wasn't any murder of Wilson's, and then he puts me through to some other Charlie, and I've got to tell him the whole story all over. Oh, Mr. Harris. And now you won't even tell me who you are, which I haven't bothered. I'm sorry for the inconvenience you've been put to. I want to know is, do you believe my story? Uh, yes, I do. And what's more, I believe you could be of great service to us. Well, that's something, I suppose. Now, if you can give me your address, I'll send a man round to question you. Tonight? Well, yes, if that's convenient for you. Mm, yeah, that's okay. 
Good. Now, what's the address? 5A Kilburn Street. 5A Kilburn Street. Kilburn Street, that's right. It's just off the Edgware Road. All right, I've got that. I'll have someone out there within the hour. No, I'll be waiting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harris. Oh, uh, by the way, how many people have you told? Only your lot. And my wife, of course. Good. Well, just make sure it doesn't go any further. It's for your own safety, you do understand. Yeah, yeah. You mean if the geezer what did it gets hold of me, I'm done for? Well, yeah, something like that. Just keep mum till our man gets there. Right, now. Goodbye, Mr. Harris. Goodbye. Right, you get all that thing here? Uh, yes, sir. 5A Kilburn Street. Take good luck, don't you think? Uh, Cherenkov's getting careless. Oh, yes, if it is him. I'm sure it is, sir. I just hope this Harris fellow got a good description. Mm. All right, well, what are you waiting for? Get round there. But does that mean I'm back in the case? What do you think? I think you've made the right move, sir. So do I. Come on, get cracking. Find out what you can. At last I can feel the net beginning to close around our Mr. Cherenkov. <laughs> Twenty to nine, and the dark man replaced the receiver of the telephone, the hackles of his neck rising in ecstasy. He felt good. But the news could have been better. He didn't like complications. He liked things to be clean and sweet. But all in all, he was happy. Life fed meaning again. 5A Kilburn Street, the voice had said. Off the Edgeway Road. Half an hour on foot. He would enjoy that, walking through the bustling London streets, mingling with the crowd, carrying a small, deadly parcel under one arm. What a lovely evening for a killing or two. A Friday night in Soho attracts people like a steep cliff attracts lemmings. Pleasure seekers all. And the man in the dark suit was no exception. As he crossed Leicester Square, he didn't look out of place. More like a well-dressed punk rocker, if there is such a thing. Yet still, even as he walked, the crowd seemed to thin out in front of him. Not seeing him, but feeling his presence and moving aside. For a brief moment, he felt like Moses crossing the Red Sea. He smiled and increased his speed, clutching harder at the small parcel under his arm. I'll get it, love. Mr. William Harris? Yeah, that's right. May I come in? Are you from the police? Um, not exactly. Here's my ID. Let's have a look. Roger Martin Sinclair. Oh, yeah, I get it. I thought something fishy was going on. You better come in. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a rather delicate situation, you understand. Come into the living room, will you? My wife's brewing up some tea. Oh, we try not to involve the general public. Won't you, uh, will you sit down? Oh, thank you. As I was saying, Mr. Harris, it's a very dangerous business I'm in. Ooh, I've got all the bruises I need to convince me of that. Things can get ugly, very ugly. Tea's up. Oh, this is my wife, Edith. Uh, my pleasure, ma'am. This is Roger Sinclair, love. The police, is it? Well, before no, no, I no, say... No, 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 no. Look, Mr. Sinclair, can you show her that card? She wouldn't believe me. The shop assistant at the Marble Arch News Agency had had a tiring day selling English phrase books and tourist guides to foreign visitors. It was five minutes to closing time, and she was looking forward to locking up and going home. The shop was empty now, apart from the man in the dark suit bending down to pick up a copy of the Evening Standard. A parcel fell from his hand and struck the floor with a dull metallic thud. She froze as he swung his head towards her and fixed her with those deep-set eyes. Slowly, he retrieved the bundle and walked towards her. He took the newspaper and a single King Edward cigar. He found a pound coin in his trouser pockets, lost among dollars, Dutch guilders, German marks and Russian rubles. He left the shop and swung out of Oxford Street into the Edgware Road. The girl sighed with relief as the warmth returned to her body. She locked the door and slid the bolt as the dark man disappeared into the crowd. Well, I was on in my last window. I thought it was funny that the light was on. Everyone's usually long gone by the time I get to start that part of the building. Oh, your tea, Mr. Sinclair. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Harris. Naturally, I took a peep inside and saw that the poor geezer what cocked it lighting up a fag. 
And then this other fellow just appears from nowhere and gives him it. Appears from nowhere? Well, that's what he seemed like. One minute there was just one of them, and then there was two, which is funny, you see, because I'd swear the door was shut. And Bill's got a very good memory, haven't you, love? Yes, I have, Mr. Sinclair. Did you get a good look at the attacker? Only a glance, but it were enough. Oh, I'm pleased to hear that. I called out, something stupid, I suppose. He turned and looked at me. I could see him better than he could see me on the other side of the dark glass, because it was getting dark, you see. He pointed the gun straight at me, and by that time I was already slipping down the ladder, and I remember hearing another shot and the window breaking. Look, there you see, somebody hit me on the head, and I don't remember nothing after that. Must have knocked me out. And what did you do when you came round? Did you come straight home? No, no, not exactly. I got into my van and drove down to the local for a couple of pints. Ooh, I'm half shaken. I'm not surprised. I had a few odd stares in my direction, as you can see. I was bleeding profuse like. Well, surely someone asked you what had happened. Oh, yeah, you bet. And I told him the truth, that I'd fallen off my ladder. Yeah, I find that a bit hard to swallow, Mr. Harris. You didn't phone the police, not then at any rate, and you didn't tell anyone at the pub about the murder. Why was that? Ah, oh, well, I was coming to that. Yes, Mr. Sinclair, honest he was. It's about this dole money, you see. For the man in the dark suit carrying the parcel, Edgware Road was longer than he remembered, or maybe he was getting older. Only the fact that his King Edward cigar was only half finished reassured him. Passing the endless shops, he'd half wished he'd caught the tube. But thinking such a thought had irritated him. He didn't like to be rushed. Nobody ever rushed him. Chap can't go around changing the habits of half a lifetime just like that. Much as he enjoyed his work, he tried to savour the moments. The silent approach. The delicious seconds before he squeezed the trigger. The satisfaction of a job well done. Despite the call, he'd realised that tonight's job might not be necessary. That annoyed him. On the other hand, there was the prospect of a double killing. That consoled him. Kilburn Street at last. 5A, the voice had said. Time for the stealthy inspection, the nonchalant walk passed. Subconsciously, the finger of his right hand began to twitch with a will of its own. I don't think you need worry about legal complications, Mr. Harris... Our aim is not to let any of this leak out. Heaven knows we have enough leaks as it is. As far as I'm concerned, your dole money is safe. Well, that's something, I suppose. Our organization isn't particularly interested in the workings of the Department of Health and uh, Social Security. And there'll very likely be a handsome reward on the way if we catch this villain. We've been after him for some time. You know, I think you boys do a grand job sorting them ruskies out, don't they, Edie? Oh, yes, they do, Bill. Um, tell me, can you draw, Mr. Harris? <laughs> I don't know about that. Yes, you can. Remember those pictures you drew for Julie and Mick? Oh, they're our grandchildren, Mr. Sinclair. Mm. Hang on, I've got some photographs in the side. No, 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 not a photograph. Love, Mr. Sinclair won't be interested in them. Well, on the contrary, Mr. Harris, I'd be delighted to have a look. Uh, perhaps while you're drawing a picture of the killer, hmm? yeah. Well, OK, I'll, I'll give it a bash. Help yourself to more tea, Mr. Sinclair. Oh, please, call me Roger. Oh, all right then, Roger. I'll just pop off and get the photo album, shall I? The man with the parcel thought it strange how quiet Kilburn Street was, seeing that it was just off the Edgware Road. Kilburn Street. <laughs> a grand name for 50 yards of Victorian tenements that ended in a brick wall with an underwear post adorbed in graffiti. Number five was just like the rest of the houses, divided into four flats, A to D. Parked outside next to a beat-up old van was a flashy new sports car. It had the smell of MI5 agent all over it. After 20 years in the business, he'd know that stench anywhere. Who were these people trying to fool? MI5 stood for mindless idiots as far as he was concerned. Still, it's just the same with all the other intelligence services. He was a connoisseur. Each brand of agent had its own odour. Even double agents couldn't hide the colour of their spots. Not from him. Not with his discerning palate. Standing in the shadow of the streetlights, he watched the house. Not yet. Perhaps when he'd finished his cigar. In the meantime, he amused himself by unwrapping the parcel 
and attaching the silencer. He didn't want to wake the neighbours. And that's our Harry on his wedding day. Uh, that's Doreen. Doesn't she look pretty? Yes, indeed. No wonder you have such beautiful grandchildren. Uh, <clears throat> uh, how's the sketch coming along, Mr. Uh, Bill? Uh, well, not bad. Not bad. Should be finished soon. Haven't got the eyes quite right yet, though. Hmm. Are you sure you remember? You only saw him for a second. Oh, I've got a good memory, especially for faces. And his was the kind of face that's difficult to forget. You see this one, Roger? Uh, yes, he did. Uh, that's my father. Does he look handsome in his uniform? Hmm. And uh, this one... Oh, now, who could that be at this hour? So it'll be for me. Oh, well, maybe it's stories to find out where I've got to. It's for me. I'll get it. You see, this should have been my bingo night. Cherenkov, about bloody time. I've got the old man drawing pictures and the old girl showing me family photos. What kept you? Your veins are showing, Roger. I don't think I could have stood the agony much longer. Do we have a ball game? And how? The old fellow's got you down to the last wart. Mm. Why couldn't you have done the job properly this afternoon? <laughs> Hindsight. Yes, all right. But get in there and finish it off. On both of them? Both of them. Mm. And then I can phone in and tell Sir Clive I arrived here and found them both dead. Oh, come on, after me. Who is it, Roger? Uh, this is Ivan Cherenkov. Works for the Ruskies. I believe you and he have met Mr. Harris. <laughs> The dark man passed through the hallway into number 5A Kilburn Street. On the wall was a mirror. He was not a pretty sight. But then, I never did have good looks, even before the accident. The gun in my hand was firm and steady, and I was happy. The kill was on. A double kill, in fact. I entered the lounge and my nostrils told me the score. Neutrals, too. KGB 1. MI 5 turned red. 1. I pulled the trigger twice. <coughs> Ivan Cherenkov and Roger Martin Sinclair both slid silently to the floor and lay in motionless heaps. The old girl's shrieking subsided into demented sobs, and the old boy's eyes and mouth were agape with horror. <laughs> There's gratitude for you. I just saved their lives, and they were looking at me as if they'd seen a ghost. Mind you, I suppose there were many similarities. But damn it all, I can't help the way I look. You mind if I use the phone? Hello, Sir Clive Haskell. Yeah? Smith here. Job's done, both of them. Oh, you were right about Sinclair. I'm leaving now. You better send them off in up squad. The old couple look like basket cases to me, but nothing that a hot cup of tea won't put right. Oh, good, that's fine. I've got men standing by. Right. Radio. Ciao. It was useless saying anything to Mr. and Mrs. H. So I tucked the parcel under one arm and strolled out of the house, down the stairs, and into Kilburn Street just off the Edgware Road. <laughs> if only Mum were alive to see me now. High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal. 